So this is the first lecture that we will have as part of the uh, catechism class that we have. As we said, catechism just basically means an oral teaching. But if we could take it kind of to a higher level, it's the teaching of the church. The teaching of the church. The church is something that we don't just take for granted. You know, a lot of people today have negativity when they hear the word church or institution. They have a negative thought because of maybe an experience they had, or maybe they've heard of some bad things that happened in different churches. But the church, according to God, it's the bride of Christ, it's the body of Christ, and it's actually called in 1 Timothy, the pillar and ground of truth. The pillar and ground of truth. It talks of the church being this. And also the church that... The, the church is the establishment that the gates of Hades cannot overcome. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ says. And He came to establish His church. So the church is not something that we take lightly. And for us as Orthodox Christians, especially being part of the Coptic Orthodox Church, it's a church of much persecution for 2,000 years, yet standing with faith for the Lord Jesus Christ. I've told this story, many, many of you and many of our brothers and sisters know this from first-hand experience or maybe they know they have a family member who have suffered. But the church is what has taught these little children when they were faced with a gun to their head and say, deny Jesus and we won't kill you. Just not become, just say you're not a Christian anymore and we won't kill you. And a little seven-year-old says, no, I love Jesus and I will never leave Jesus. This is the church that I'm talking about. The Coptic Orthodox Church. So our church are, is, has given us this catechism. And we're going to call this class the catechism class of St. Mary. The Virgin Mary. Because she's when you think of theologians or great writers or people that have really written so much on doctrine or theology. Obviously St. Mary is not one of those people. Her, she had very, very few words actually in the Bible. But she is actually the best theologian. Saint Mary was the best theologian because she was chosen to be who? Not just anyone, the mother of God. The mother of God. What is a theologian? It's the person who really knows God. Who knew God the most? Very clearly his mother. There's no one that knows God more than his own mother, right? That's why he chose her because of her great love for him. So we are going to follow Saint Mary's model, a simple model. We're not going to talk into too many broad terms or bring too many huge theological issues into our classes. But we're going to take it step by step and try to understand it together. And we'll also kind of open it up for a discussion. So, <clears throat> to start off, the true theologian, the true theologian is not the one necessarily who just studies but the true theologian, the person who gets to know God, is the one who prays. This is what the fathers have said. The true theologian is the one who prays. And prayer and theology cannot be separated from the two. Because theology can very easily be a mental understanding, a mental knowledge. Can we have, please, everyone sit down? Theology can very easily be a mental knowledge, an education. I can know all about God, but do I really know God? And some of the best theologians who ever lived are people who didn't even know how to read or write. People that didn't even know how to read or write, yet knew God more than so many others. So, this catechism class is, and this first topic, and may the Lord have mercy on me that we're going to be talking about this, is to try to understand who God is. In our limited, weak uh, sinful minds and what God has uh, shown to us through the scriptures and through the church trying to understand a little of who God is God of course when we try to explain who God is this is where actually where all the heresies come right this is where all the people who made up their own idea of God and their own theology these were these are things that we can say that are against Christianity or against what God teaches or the Bible teaches so we are so, so careful when we tread these waters. God reveals Himself in such a simple way that a child can understand. Yet 
we know so little about him that the greatest theologians can say they only have scratched the surface to try to understand the tiniest bit of God. He's so simple that a child can understand him, yet the greatest theologians cannot understand him. It's a perplexity. It's this mystery of understanding God. And I'll give you an example of how this plays out continually in my own house. So, whenever my daughter does something really cute, or something that it just, I can't just stop and I just say, Abby, you don't understand how much I love you. And she says, yes, I do. And I said, you don't understand. And then she says, yes, I do. And I said, you don't understand. Then she says, I understand Jesus. And I say, okay, you won. <laughs> and every single time we do this argument, she says, I understand Jesus. And I can't beat her because she does really understand Christ. How God is revealed to the little children. Yet the mystery of God infinitely perplexes the greatest of the most intellectual theologians. The church, in trying to explain who God is, this is what the church does. One of our liturgies, a very early liturgy from the 3rd century, sorry, from the 4th century, it's called the Gregorian Liturgy. And this is what we say of God. Worthy and right, worthy and right, worthy and right, it is fitting indeed and right that we praise you, we bless you, we serve you, we worship you, we glorify you. We know what we're supposed to do for you, Lord. This is the least that we could do to you. You are the one true God, the lover of mankind. And now here's the explanation. Ineffable. Anybody know what the word ineffable means? Ineffable means no words can describe who you are. Ineffable, invisible, infinite without beginning, everlasting, timeless, immeasurable, incomprehensible, unchangeable, creator of all and savior of everyone. What is the church saying? Lord, we don't know anything about you, barely anything. You are something that words can't describe. You're incomprehensible. You can fit in the heart of the smallest child Yet at the same time, the whole universe can't contain you, Lord. This is the mystery of trying to understand God. What we do know, what do we know about God? God is above anything related to us. Yet He humbled Himself and took the form of a servant. We are created in His own image and likeness. And however, He is not necessarily the same being in the sense that we are beings. He's infinite and everlasting, yet he, and He always was, He always is, and He always shall be. He does not need us, yet He fills us and loves us, and is in, inside of us and filling this church at this very moment and present with us now. He is with us now, yet He's also outside of time. and outside of physical realm. The Bible continues to give us little bits and pieces of, of trying to understand who God is. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, it says, God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For what, man, what person knows a man's thoughts except the Spirit of the man which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except, except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is from God that we might understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. The Bible is basically saying, no one can know God except himself, his own spirit. But God still wants to reveal his gifts to us, his children. The Lord said something very similar in Matthew 11, 25. He says, At that time Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. The things that are the wise and the most intellectual, 
can't understand, have been hidden from their own understanding. Yet, you reveal these things to little babes. Yea, Father, for such is gracious, your gracious will. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. No one knows the Father except the Son. No one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows God except His own Spirit. Only God can understand Himself. Yet, He still reveals things to us. There are things that are only and will ever only be known by God because He is beyond our knowledge and comprehension. And there are things that He reveals to us. This is the mystery of trying to understand and explain God. How important is this revelation? How important is it to know God? Is it really important to know God if we can only understand very few bits and pieces of what He reveals to us? This is how important it is to know God. This is what He tells us. Tony, watch your God. Jesus spoke these words in John 17, the most beautiful chapter in all of the Holy Bible, John 17. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has now come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. This is the part I want us to focus on. And this is eternal life. And this is eternal life. This is what he tells us. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. How important is it to know God? He said it himself. It's what? It's eternal life itself. And St. Paul tells us that we will be, when we go to heaven, we're going to be going from glory to glory. What does that mean? That we're going to ever be knowing and learning about God for eternity. How beautiful and how amazing is that? Forever we'll be falling in love with God and forever we'll be getting to know Him more and more from glory to glory. This is eternity. And I taste eternity from now. And I get to get to understand what He reveals to me from now. Today more than ever, we need to hear these words. Because in a day and age where knowledge has almost become a God in itself, where people when they think they know so much, they become their own God. I remember I had a college professor. And he was, um, he was from Iran. He taught us history. And there were several, several people from different cultures in the class. And it was history of early, early ancient history. And so many of the people in the class came from ancient cultures, like the Indians, myself being a, a Coptic Christian Egyptian. Uh, there was people from China. And we were amazed at his knowledge. When we begin to talk about any kind of civilization or culture, he knew so much about it. And when he found out as a Coptic Christian, he said, Oh, I've been to Egypt. And he started to name off things of the early Christians and the early Christian church. And when he began to speak about China, so on and so forth, and India. And we began to talk, the students in the class, we wonder what he is. He knows so many civilizations. He knows about so many cultures. I wonder what faith he has. He's from Iran. He may be Muslim. So... We decided to ask him at the beginning of class. We said, Professor, you know about the ancient Egyptians and you know about the Chinese and you know about these Indians and you know about so many cultures. Which, which God, what religion do you follow? And he said, yes, you know, I used to be like most people believing in God till I realized I am God. Can you imagine he said this? I am God. And we all paused. And we like looked at each other. And we said, okay, we didn't know that. 
<laughs> well, it's finally nice to meet you, right? We expected a little more. <clears throat> but this is what, unfortunate, it's actually sad that we're laughing at that because so many people have fallen into this trap believing that they are their own gods. I was walking in a store and a man approached me. He said, oh, are you a priest? He saw I was wearing a cross. And I said, yes. And he said, oh, I'm Catholic. And we began to talk about how amazing God is and the work that God is doing in our churches. And as we were talking, we were standing in the line to check out As we were talking, a lady butts into our conversation. And she said, you know, all religions are just different paths and different truths leading to the same place. To show us that we're down here and she knows much more than us, right? And we weren't putting down anyone. Or we weren't judging anyone. We're just talking about how amazing God is. And that lady caught me on the wrong day. Because that was right after a suicide bomber entered a church, one of our churches, and blew himself up, killing dozens and dozens of people, including little children. And I stopped and I said, wait a second. I cannot accept what you just said. Are you telling me a suicide bomber who just came into one of our churches and blew up innocent people, men, women, and little children, that he ended up in the same place as the, the place where those children and those innocent people died, they ended up in the same place? And she couldn't say any word. It's absurd what people are saying about God today. Let's just take that statement for a second. Are all religions different parts of the truth leading up to the same place? It's actually part of Satan's trickery. How can we say God is one and God is many? How can we say God exists and He doesn't exist? How can we say God is unlimited yet limited? How can we say God is tangible and untangible? How can we say God is real and yet he is a figment of our imagination and all are the same. It's absurdity. And it's disrespect and a deception by Satan. And this is not something new by Satan. From the very earliest of times, Satan did the same thing. Do you remember what he did with Eve? What was the first temptation that he placed before Eve? He didn't tell her, go ahead and eat from the tree right away. What did he say? Did God really tell you not to eat from all the trees? Do you see the temptation in that? Getting her to what? To think of and to ponder and to question who God is. God's identity. Is God really good? Wait a second. Oh, of course He wouldn't want you to eat from it because He knows in the day you eat of it, your mind will be open, your eyes will be open. You won't be like God. What did the professor say? You know, humanity is striving to be like God. But we're doing it in the worst and the most wrong of ways. And if we break it down and simplify it and really understand it, are we like God, yes or no? What did God create us in? His what? Image and Likeness. Are we like God? Yes or no? Of course we are. Of course we are. As much as we respect all of creation, but there is a huge difference between animals, plants, and humans. We are the children of God. God came to die for us. And that's exactly the point. God wants us to know Him so bad that He died for us. God died to reveal Himself to us. And this is the ultimate revelation of God. When the Lord Jesus Christ humbled Himself, emptied Himself, took the form of a servant, and became like us 
to show us who He is. The disciples, it was too much for them. They saw these great miracles. They saw Him walking on water. They saw Him raise the dead. They saw Him feeding the multitudes. But they also saw Him weak. They saw Him cry. And they saw Him hungry. This is the mystery of the unity of the incarnation of the Logos. To the point that the disciples asked Him, please, just show us the Father and this is enough for us. That's all we want. Do you remember what the Lord Jesus Christ said? Have I been so long with you, Philip, and yet you do not know me? He who has seen me hmm, has seen the Father. He who has seen me has seen the Father. The Lord reveals to Himself to us through His Word. Through creation, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament proclaims His power. Day after day utters speech and night after night utters knowledge. God is revealing and revealing and revealing Himself through creation. Invisible attributes of God. God reveals Himself through the Word of God, the Bible. God reveals Himself, himself to us in the church, through the liturgy, through the holy body and precious blood. And not only does God reveal Himself and wants us to know Him, I will say a statement, I want you to please grasp this. He wants to be known by us. What does that mean? Not only does He want us to know Him, He wants to know us. He wants to know us. Well, you say, wait a second, didn't God create all of us? Isn't He the Creator? Isn't, doesn't He know everything? Yet, we read in Matthew 25, and the five wise and the five foolish virgins, the ones who were ready and went into the wedding, God likened the second coming to a man, a bridegroom who is getting married. And those who were ready went into the wedding with him and the door was shut. And then the, the foolish ones, the ones who weren't prepared, the ones who didn't have the oil, they came and they knocked. Lord, Lord, open to us. He said, what? Part from me, I what? I never knew you. I never knew you. God wants us to know him and God wants, want, he wants to know us. He wants to know us. Knowing Him is much more than knowing of Him, right? Means what? It means intimacy. It means that I have to live with Him and abide with Him and commune with Him. I love how it says in the Acts, in Him we live and move and have our being. Do I have my identity like this? I live and move and have my being. How much God wants to know us completely existing in Him. This is the point of Christianity. Where do we start? One of the most famous verses that I really love so much. And it kind of seems like it works backwards. Listen to what it says. Faith. Description of faith. It says in Hebrews 11.6, But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. When does God reveal himself to us? Is it from the very beginning? Does he reveal himself to us when I first have faith? No. It says what? He who comes to God must believe that he is. I have to first come believing. And then he will reward me for diligently seeking him kind of works backwards. If you think logically, first I should say, well, He should reveal Himself to me, then I will what? Believe Him, right? No, it doesn't work like that with God. Because He tells us what? I'm revealing myself all the time. You should know already that I've been revealing myself. You just look outside. Look at the sunset. Look at a butterfly flying. Smell the most beautiful flower and I'm revealing myself to you listen to your heart that's ticking away 
I'm revealing myself to you. Every breath that you take and every heartbeat that you have, who has given that to you? You didn't give that to yourself. I gave that to you. You have to come to me believing first. And if you diligently seek me, I will never let you down. I am will reward you. I was reading the story of Abraham and Lot this week. And it's exactly this. Abraham had a nephew named Lot. And he kind of adopted him. And everywhere he went, he took Lot with him. Abraham was so blessed that they began to become so successful. They had sheep and herds and cattle. And Abraham had his own men and Lot had his own men of shepherds and taking care of all their all the, the things that they owned. And the men started to have strife with one another. So Abraham told Lot, let there be no strife between us, between you and me and your workers and mine. Choose where you want to go, and I will go the opposite way. Do you see the faith in that statement? God has promised Abraham something, that he would be blessed and that many nations will come from him. And eventually the Messiah himself will come from this man, Abraham, the friend of God. Lot, he did what most of us, 99% of us would do. He said, okay, I'll have an opportunity to choose whatever I want. What did he do? He looked up, he looked all around and found the most green place. It said what? That it was the best watered place where the river Jordan flowed. The most serene, the most prosperous. I want that. He went and he applied what? His sight. Abraham, even in just asking that question, he trusted God already. He knew God was going to bless him. So it didn't matter where Lot would choose, if he would choose first. It didn't matter, because God at the end would bless him. He lived by the, the Bible verse that wasn't written yet. All things work to the good for those who love God. He knew it was going to work out because he loved God. Lot chose on his own. Lot did not consult Abraham and say, No, you are the one who raised me. You are my, like my father. You choose first. I can never. No. He chose by greed. And the first thing he did was went far away, deep into that lush ground, and he, it said he pitched a tent. Abraham didn't move from that spot. He didn't say, okay, Lot went that way, I'm going to go this way right now. No. You know what he did? He waited for God. And then the Lord told him, okay, go this way, and I will bless you. And you know what Abraham did? He took his tent, and what is the first thing he did? Anybody remember? He built an altar. One guy went by sight, the other by faith. One said, I'm going to live here and make my dwelling. The other said, I'm not going to move from where I am till you direct me, Lord. One pitched his tent, the other built an altar. And we know what ended up happening to Lot said that righteous soul was tormented and persecuted for being in the land of Sodom and Gomorrah, the evil that was taking place there. And of course, Abraham became the one who was blessed. What am I doing? Am I living by faith or am I living by sight? This is the first Sunday of our normal service and regular service as a church that will be here hopefully as a beacon of light with God's grace pointing people to the Good Shepherd. So we have a few things that I want us to focus on as a church. I mentioned this yesterday and I want everyone to take this as a personal motto and theme in their life. Everything is for Christ. Everything is with Christ. Everything is in Christ. And everything is through Christ. 
Everything is for Christ. Everything is with Christ. Everything is in Christ. And everything is through Christ. For Christ, why? What are we doing here on this earth? Why are we living? Everything is for you, O Lord Jesus Christ. But the only way I can have and live for you, Lord, is with you. With you by my side because I will fall. And I will make mistakes. And I will go back to my own ways. I need your help, so be with me. And I'm doing all things for you and with you so I can be in you, O Lord Jesus Christ. So I am abiding in you and you in me. And I'm not living for myself, but the only way I can abide in you, Lord, is through you, Lord Jesus Christ. Can we say it together? For Christ, with Christ, in Christ, through Christ. One last time. For Christ, with Christ, in Christ, through Christ. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit. Now and forever. Let's pray together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, we love you, Lord Jesus.